Hey everyone, I am Diana Edelman, host of Emergency Drinks. And today joining me on Emergency Drinks is my dear friend, Chef Emily Hirsch. Emily, I miss your face and I'm really sad we're not sitting next to each other having emergency drinks right now. I know, don't remind me. Like every day I think about you, I think about Tamar, I think about our <laughs> little group in New York and I miss you guys so much. But this is, is this is... As much as I can get from you, then I'm happy and I'm <laughs> blessed to see your face. Well, I mean, but it's not enough. No, I need to be in person with you. No. So emergency drinks. This is what I'm having today um, because I, I'm still working. So this is a curious elixir number five and it's smoked Ooh. cherry co chocolate, old fashioned booze free craft cocktail. Yum. We shall see. We shall see. Where do you see. buy that? Um, I don't know. They sent it to me. <laughs> okay. But I will find out. Too. I will find <laughs> out. You just do this twice and then it's a twist off. There we go. All right. And so what are you drinking? Are you going to wait before I go into my drink? Are you going to no. pour it over like ice or are you going to drink it straight? I'm drinking it straight because I'm classy. Very classy. I want to <laughs> know. Take a sip and read it and then I will, I will go into my drink. Ooh, it smells like beef jerky it smells beef very jerky, smoky is what fashion. i'm trying to say yeah 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 mm, okay that's not a bad thing good mm, yes i wasn't sure how i was gonna feel about it i love it i that, i love okay. the smoky so yeah it's i love very smoky good. too i love mm. smoky. now you're giving me all these ideas oh. i need to go well, get here, that let me tell you what's in it it's lightly carbonated filtered water with dark cherry elderberry orange lemon juice concentrate extracts of cacao mm. shatavari ginger chicory american oak gentian i don't know if i'm saying that right cayenne unrefined coconut sugar organic smoke flavors and sea salt okay i'll just go make it i'll just go whip can that you? up no. I always have you. I always send you things. I'm like, can you remake this? Recreate this for oh me. Oh my I'm god, like, that would take me like five years to remake. I'm just gonna yeah. go buy it. A fair. Okay. Fair. <laughs> I am drinking a little mocktail as well. Mocktail vibes today. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's also cherry, but the base is this amethyst like liqueur, uh, blueberry, ginger, and mint. My okay. mom got it for me for my birthday from Home Goods. Home but goods for good. all your mocktail like, needs. What? Home goods for all your mocktail needs. All your mocktail needs. Yeah, she got me like five different kinds of mocktails from Home Goods, and this is the only one that was good. So, oh, that, I know, I know. She tried, but then I'm, I made it. I mix it with this. It's like Cascade. It's my go-to for like adding flavor to mocktails. Okay. And a little bit of lime juice and a little bit of tonic water. That sounds delicious. Yeah, it's good. It's very summery. I'm getting, and it's red, getting ready for the 4th of July. That's tomorrow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because are you cooking anything special for 4th of July tomorrow? No, just probably grilling some Impossible Burgers, but mm. nothing like fancy. Sure. Nothing fancy. So I, I'm just going to do a very basic intro for people who don't know you, Chef Hirsch. Emily, <laughs> I met Emily um, two summers ago when wow. she was the you were brought in to pure grit barbecue to create all the recipes and if you yep. have not been in new york city and you're listening from somewhere else um pure grit barbecue was a barbecue spot that was fully vegan and entirely gluten-free and so right. the smoked brisket that pure grit makes is like I don't like a brisket for some reason. I don't like barbecue really, but whatever y'all are making a pure grit, like give it to me every day, all day, because it was so good. But not only were you the chef at Pure Grit, you also have a really cool backstory. So I actually don't want to steal your thunder. So if you would like to tell everyone your your um chef story i would love for you to share it i would love to share so going back i guess it's like six years now i can't Has believe really? how fast yeah time goes by so fast and i can't believe we've been friends for two years now you know it's our anniversary two summers ago weeks. i know 
So that's really cute. But um, going back to the summer of, well, I'll go back even further. When I was a, um, when I was in college, I was a collegiate dancer and had been dancing all my life. Did, you know, hip hop, jazz, all of the, all of the thing. Dance was pretty much my identity. I made it up into the collegiate level, uh, the University of Texas at Austin, being a dancer. And I think this is actually a really good timing to talk about because the, that Dallas Cowboys cheerleader thing just came out on Netflix. Have you watched it I yet? have not. No, I don't know if I can, honestly, yeah. <laughs> because of PTSD. Um, but yeah, so it was... it. Definitely not as intense as the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, but it was very, very superficial, very um, toxic in the sense of the coaches. And I'm sure that there you could go watch like Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders and and make make um make what it was the word make connections to that. And so through that, there was a really, really big focus on body image and. Luckily, I had never been able, I had never thought about that growing up. Of course, like you have your, your days as a woman where you're a little bit insecure about your body, but it was never anything um, extreme until I got up into the collegiate level. And so uh, once I started having those like really toxic coaches and the really bad body image. Um, I didn't really know how to feel my body as an athlete either. I miss the New York Sirens. Oh, like you can hear. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, not at all. That it really makes just my heart happy. kill everything. <laughs> it makes my heart happy. Okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, so through that, I ended up getting an eating disorder. Um, I didn't know that it was an eating disorder until going to like weeks of therapy. My therapist was like, Emily, I think this is an eating disorder. You need to, you need to get this checked out. So I dealt with that as well as being an athlete. What was the eating disorder? It was anorexia Mm -hmm. and binge eating. So it was like the beautiful combination of the worst. (laughs) worst Yeah. I I don't, I mean, all of them are, all of them are terrible, but yeah. um, So yeah. And it, it, another, I feel like we would need like five hours to talk about just like the stigma of eating disorders. Oh, we're totally going to talk about that because- (laughs) I mean, what you and I, I I know this about you, but I think what people don't know about me is that I also have an eating disorder. And so, yeah, I totally want to talk about all of these things, but we will get, I digress. This is like, this is to build up to the chef thing because I can't tell my story about being a chef without telling why I wanted to be a chef. Um, But yes, we need to talk about that because that's one of the reasons why I love you so much. And I feel like I can open up to you because we, we've been through the same thing, but anyways, so I, um, I was very fit. Like I was super in shape. I could lift a lot of weights. I could run really fast. Um, you know, like I could dance for hours. Like I looked like I was really healthy, but I was not. Um, my mind was a mess. I did not know how to take care of my body. And there were times where this is really, um, this is really vulnerable, but I think it's important to be vulnerable, especially mm-hmm. on like on podcasts. But there was a moment where I remember I was, um, and this is trigger warning, by the way, for anybody who has an eating disorder, if this does, if this triggers you, then maybe skip the next 30 seconds. But I remember I found myself kneeling over the toilet, trying to make myself throw up mm-hmm. and it almost became an also bulimia. I, I luckily had the strength to stop myself and I had an amazing support system which was one person was my mom and I just called her right away. And I was like, I need to fix this. So luckily I didn't get as far as, uh, as I saw it going with how I was treating myself and how my environment was. So I ended up um, not making it back on the dance scene that next year. Thank God, because it were they have weighing been... you? Like, were they, they like luck- checking no. you in? They weren't weighing, but they were very, um, it was very manipulative in the way that they don't need to say anything. They just make the comments. They walk into the practice. They give you the up down. Um, there was one point where they told me that I needed to dye my hair brown because they didn't think that I was performing well as a uh, a blonde. They said you you perform better as a brunette. What does Obviously, that even they, mean? Like the I audience likes you better as a brunette. You <laughs> move better as a what the fuck? Yeah. 
And this, this was going back from uh, the year before I was on the dance team at a different college and the environment was amazing. Like so supportive. The girls supported each other. Body image yeah. wasn't even part of the dancing. And I felt unstoppable. Like I felt like at the highest peak level I was at dancing. And it's crazy. It just shows you how much an environment can infect such a malleable mind of an 18 yeah. year old. Ugh. And so it, it just like, uh, they put it in your mind, like you're not good enough and you're going to have to prove it. And that's not how you should treat, you know, young women. Like you should we be, you should so, be building them up. I mean, up until we're 23, our frontal lobe or something, it's not even fully developed. And right. we start getting told as little kids, you're fat. You're this, mm -hmm. you're that. You'd look good if you lost weight. What are right. they like these people, what they're doing to, to yeah. these to kids just yeah. is, is so destructive. Right. It really, really is. And so that um didn't make it back on the dance team, which was a blessing in disguise. I was yeah. I was torn up about it, but that was what that gave me the space to really focus on healing. And so therapy. You know, I went into a uh, an outpatient recovery center where I got to meet other girls with eating disorders, and uh, it wasn't an environment that I necessarily thrived in. But I do remember this one moment where we were in their kitchen at it was called the Eating Recovery Center. So they had a kitchen, and one of the activities that we all did together was we cooked. And um, one of the things we cooked was it was a baked brie with like a like a jelly on top or something like that. And I was just like, this is so fun. We're not worrying about what the food is. We're just like, it's a community. We're all being vulnerable together because this was all really hard for us to be like, oh, we're baking something that's like fatty, like quote unquote yeah. or whatever. It was really good exposure therapy. And that was the first, um, that was the first little seed that was planted in my mind of like, whoa, cooking can really really heal. And it's, I can already tell that it's healing me. And so after graduating, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. So I found this culinary school in New York that was 85% plant-based um, because throughout that journey, I also became a vegetarian, which was another reason why another, like, let me start over. I, I, became a vegetarian and that really spanned a passion, another passion because vegan and vegetarian cooking is so creative and I never experienced that kind of creativity before in cooking. And so I, I opened up a whole new world, pretty much of food. And so I attended this culinary school, absolutely loved it. Um, after that, I was planning on becoming a private chef, but we all had to do an internship. And so I interned at this restaurant called Dirt Candy that is in the Lower East Side of uh, New York and now has a Michelin star. Didn't have it when I was there, but I can, I'm still going to say that I worked at a Michelin star restaurant. I, I think that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I think it counts. You helped and them so, get to the Michelin star. Yeah. Yeah. We'll say that. Of course it was it, totally. And me as the <laughs> garmange and the salad, the salad station helped them get the Michelin star. Hey. <laughs> Whatever. But um, <laughs> it was, it was awesome. And I learned a lot and Four months into that job, I got a strange message on LinkedIn saying, hey, we're auditioning for Fox's Hell's Kitchen. Would you like to audition? So thought that was a scam. I had been four months into cooking. I was 20, 21. Uh, I was like, I don't know what this is, but I guess I'll just, I'll just see what happens. It ended up being real, which is cool. Lots of interview processes um, happened after that for a couple of months and it ended up they were casting for this young season so it was ages 21 to 25 and so I was lucky enough to get casted on the show um it's season 20 of Hell's Kitchen and that completely solidified my love for cooking and media and sharing my story to help others and was that amazing. was 2020 right that was yeah it, we, it was filmed in 2019 Oh, okay. And and then COVID happened, and so yeah. the the show was postponed to air for two years. During that time, I moved back to Texas during COVID and just tried to figure out my life. We weren't allowed to talk about the show, so I did a bunch of other things, recipe development. I had a cookie business. I was a private chef. <laughs> cookie business? 
Why have you never made me cookies, Emily? Dude, and they were vegan and gluten-free cookies. I know. I'm well, I'm just gonna have to I'm gonna have to come up there. You're gonna have to come yeah. down here. I'll make you all the uh-huh. cookies you want. Yes, please. But yeah, so I, I got to experiment in different realms of the sh- of the chef because you don't just have to be a chef in the restaurants which was an important thing that I figured out and then the show aired and that was a really cool experience and I was able to meet a lot of people and including Carrie Fitzmaurice who hired me to be the culinary director of Pure Grit and create the recipes and that was a whole nother challenge and an amazing experience where I moved back up to New York I got to meet you and just really be involved in in the vegan plant-based lifestyle of cooking and so yeah so that was that was kind of the end of restaurants for me after that I got into food media and worked for a couple companies doing their social media and now I am fully focused on um, my brand where I am cooking for people's holistic health and wellness doing private chefing. I'm back in Houston, or I, I'm not back in Houston. I moved to Houston. I'm from San Antonio, but I moved to Houston. Um, so yeah, it's been a journey. I'm still feel like I'm figuring it out, but um, it's been a crazy six years of lots of different things going on. Um, what was working with Gordon Ramsay like? Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> I he's, loved him. Yeah. He, I feel like he's gotten nicer, nicer over the years. He was, he, you know, like he started off calling people like cow like fat cows and like really but he I think he found his niche because I'm sure that was like very uh movie magic like they kind of forced that on him to be like that because he was such a sweetheart he really taught me a lot um about cooking because I was so inexperienced and so he knew that he would come over we would be on like the fish station or something and he would teach me how to cook scallops and he was right next to me, putting them on his hand, like seasoning them. It's just very, you can tell he really cares about the people who come through and who show the, him how hard you want to work. So it, it's amazing. I look up to him. He's definitely one of my biggest mentors that I've ever had. And um, yeah, he's he's awesome. And he, he did tell me that, do we cuss on this podcast? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> you can do <see> whatever <laughs> he you want. Did, he did tell me to fuck off. So that was a an honor. I, uh, yeah. I'm like, if Gordon Ramsay told me to fuck off, I would be like, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, chef. Be like, now I can die. Absolutely. <laughs> Sir Ramsay. Thank you. I'm oh, fuck off. Thank you. I would fuck off. <laughs> right off. And like prance away, like on cloud nine, that Gordon oh my Ramsay God. told me to fuck That's off. That's basically what I did. That's Good. basically what I did. I love that. How did that, how did that come to be where he told you that? Um, we were, it wasn't actually fuck off. It was shut the fuck up. So it was, yeah, same thing. I was like, when you're on the line, which is the the kitchen, like, so there's different stations, you call it the line. Um, I was on one station and we're supposed to be telling Gordon Ramsay how long it is until the dish is going to be ready or whatever. And so I think I was making risotto and he asked me how long it was going to take. And I go, six minutes, chef. And he goes, don't give me that ah uh, bullshit. And I was like, I get it. And so I was like, sorry, chef, six minutes. And so he walks away. I think he was trying to put pressure on me to see what I would do. Because he did that a lot to, to the um, contestants. And so I was like, sure. okay, this is my turn. He keeps coming back. And he... I think he he said something else on the second time. I don't remember because I was already in my head. The tears were coming and oh. he he walked away and then he came back and he goes, Emily? I go, yes, chef. And he goes, shut the fuck up. He didn't say anything. So I go, yes, chef. To your head. <laughs> he wanted to get in my head, I think, I think. But it was really, I... Half of me was like, oh my God, he said, he told me to shut the fuck up. This is amazing. The other half of me was like, Emily, you're a piece of shit. Like, shut the fuck up. (laughs) Like, he's crashing and burning. So it was, it was really, that was funny. But I remember it now fondly because I I see it like out from the outside in. I'm like, that was a really cool moment. Like, yeah, working for him in a tense situation. It gave me a thick skin. And, you know, now I, I, 
you have to be like to work to work back of house. I feel like you you better have like the thickest skin in the world. You know, I grew yeah. up in the restaurant industry twenty years ago when sexual harassment was like legal for all, all intents and purposes, and you know it. it People could say whatever they wanted to you. They could grab your ass. They were so wholly inappropriate. Didn't matter yeah. if you cried. Better if you cried, actually, for them. And yeah. uh, it, was, it was a really abusive situation. So you yeah. really do, especially now. I'm. I don't. I doubt kitchens are still like as bad as they were when I was in the kitchen. But I believe still, that. Yeah. It's a tough. It's a tough place to be, and you really do need to have thick skin. Yeah, especially for for a woman, and I think yeah. I t I agree with you. Like, it's definitely getting better, but I do remember the same kind of things happening when I was a line cook. Uh, I would have a a man line cook the same level as me, yeah, if not at a lower station than me, come up and like tickle my side. Like, don't don't touch well, me. <laughs> stop. You can't Why? do that in in the corporate industry, and there's like the whole issue on mental health and. And having like an HR department in, in yeah. um, the restaurants, which, uh, maternal leave or yeah, maternal leave and all of that. But I, I do think it's getting better. I think that what I've been seeing, there have been a lot of women coming up to the forefront and fighting mm -hmm. for those things. So yeah. that's really good to see. Well, I feel like chefs, uh, including Mario Batali and David Chang, who just had that whole thing come out they're not being held as accountable as I think they should be. Maybe Batali a little bit more because he was the first one to really kind of get called out. But like David Chang, he's everywhere still. I think he apologized a, a very piss poor apology a couple of years yeah. ago, but reading that none of it shocked me. It was just sad. Yeah. And I felt really bad for the people in the kitchen and the people that yeah. are victims of that because it's abuse and right. it's just, it's troublesome. And it's troublesome to me that they, they still get away with it. Like it's still yeah. acceptable. Like he was yeah. never canceled. He had a one bad eater article about him and mm -hmm. he, I, it's just, it's crazy to me, but I do want to ask you as we're talking about body positivity and weight, because, uh, and I actually have a, a separate podcast um, where I'm just kind of talking about my history with obesity and weight loss. Uh, but as as you said, you have a binge eating disorder and so do I. And I never really realized what it was until like three years ago when I was in, or two years ago when I was in therapy here in New York. And I had started talking because at that point I weighed the most I've ever weighed in my life. And I literally would just order food to eat to feel better about myself. Cause it was the one thing I could control. I can't control the way I look. I can't control my weight, but you know what? I can control what I put into my body. And what I want to put into my body is some fucking pizza right now, you know, or a Jarrell's <laughs> yeah. burger or fries right. or all of it, you know? And I basically, I came to realize that I wasn't hungry for any of these things. And being a food writer, because I've been a food writer since 2015, mm -hmm. you're constantly given food. Like chefs come up to you and they bring you out the entire vegan menu because they want you to try it and photograph it and write about it. And I would eat all of it, all of it. And I would just, I would just say, oh, I can't wait to go home and take a nap and go to bed. But really, I just, I, I didn't know how to stop eating. My brain wouldn't turn off. I would just continue mm -hmm. to eat and eat and eat. And it just spiraled. And then it became, well, when I'm unhappy, I would order food. When I was stressed, I would order food. When I had anxiety, I literally, all I wanted to do was chew on something. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it just became really, really out of control. And Right around that time, I got COVID, and then I had long COVID. Ugh. And the long COVID basically, because at this point in my life, I was working out all the time. I was biking 14 miles a day. I was, I was eating. And I want to talk about like the words we use when we describe what we eat, but I'm going to mm -hmm. hold on that for a second. But I was eating what I thought was appropriate to be eating to be losing weight. And I wasn't losing weight. I would joke and, and say, I can look at a piece of cake and I gain five pounds. But it was true. I would just 
if I looked at it, it would whoop, like magically just jump from the plate to my hips or to my face or to whatever. And when I got long COVID, I got sinus tachycardia, which basically means uh, I had a normal heart beat or rhythm, but elevated. And so I mm-hmm. would be sitting down and my heart rate would be 90 something. And mm-hmm. so I went into physical therapy for it and I couldn't get my heart rate over 120. But my heart rate getting to 120 would just be walking. And so I couldn't work out anymore. And I got really, really, really depressed because all of a sudden nothing I was doing was working. And here I was knowing at this point that like I have no control over what I eat. All I hear in my brain is eat, 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 never you're full. And then also I'm so upset about this. I'm so depressed. I'm just going to keep eating because that will make me feel better. So Mm -hmm. being in the culinary industry and Mm -hmm. knowing that you're anemic, Anemic? Is that anorexic? Sorry. Wrong. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I was like, wait, right. wait, I'm anemic? JK, JK. But knowing you're anorexic and knowing you have binge eating, what kind of challenges were that for you that mm-hmm. so you wouldn't get triggered? So you wouldn't put yourself in a situation where you would feel like it was a downward spiral for you or a challenge to you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the whole reason why I became a chef was Mm -hmm. to face the fear of food head on. If Mm. we're, if we're thinking of the external reasons why I wanted to be a chef, yes, of course I want to help people. I want to cook. It's very creative. Mm -hmm. Internally, I was, I was terrified of food. I was terrified of eating. I was terrified of like what the quote unquote right way to eat was. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of wanted to take the control back because once I reached the the peak of the intensity of my binge eating disorder and anorexia is just like a flip flop. I felt, and people who have an eating disorder, I'm sure can relate, felt just feel out of control, even though they're trying yeah. so hard to control everything. Yeah. And so it was my way of kind of like taking my power back, feeling empowered through cooking. And so for a long time, for a couple of years, that did put a pause on my eating disorder. And because I was being creative and because I was being fulfilled, I didn't feel as much pressure around food and uh, like the pressure of do, do I eat this? Am I eating too much? You know, the negative self-talk that goes on when you have an eating disorder. Uh, Luckily, it's the worst. Yeah. Like the things you think about yourself are just awful. We're so abusive to ourselves. In in general, I think everybody is, if you looked inside everybody's mind, they're probably really mean to themselves. But when you have something like an eating disorder or you're neurodivergent in some way with anxiety, like, which I also have, is anxiety. (laughs) This is why we're such uh, good friends. (laughs) I know, right? It it was meant to be. all the things. (laughs) It was meant to be. But it just is like makes it it makes it unbearable, and so yeah. no wonder you turn to food. It, it's such a thing that that also people shame you about in in society is like, yeah. you know, they 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 label these people who have binge eating disorders or who are living in larger bodies, and it's just like they don't understand. Like it's it's totally a natural phenomenon to cope with food. You're yeah. you're literally just trying to soothe yourself from all of the shit that is happening in the world. That was going on a rant. Uh, yeah. So I, I was able to, it, it kind of went away for a little bit in my mind, my eating disorder. And then once I got back into stressful situations, like pure grit, opening a restaurant, being, you know, working lots of hours, managing people who, uh, what I really had a hard time with is just being in charge of, a a group of individuals who are the hardest workers I've ever seen in my life, not being paid enough, not being treated well, just like just seeing their history of that. We try, we treated them, you know, very well at Pure Grit, but just their, their lifestyle, the restaurant industry is not. And then I was dealing, yeah. And, and, and I was dealing with personal issues and my relationship. And so that, all of that, once the stress came back, like once I was done with culinary school and it was like, yay, I'm, you know, I, I feel so free. I'm in New York. Like it's all fun. Once the real reality started to come back and like the natural pressures of life came back was when I started to cope with food again. And um, that was just like, wait, I thought I was over this. 
And that's when you, I realized that like you, once you have an eating disorder or you're disordered eating, like it never really goes away. It's just a constant Mm -mm. iteration of like, okay, what is happening in my life and how is my eating disorder talking to me right now? And so sometimes it's really loud. Sometimes it's not. And how I deal with it is therapy, obviously. (laughs) Therapy is super, super important, but also just like trying to be kind to myself um, whenever I'm having those, those thoughts and redirecting, which can be really hard sometimes. Probably the biggest thing that has helped me has been this concept called intuitive eating. It's this, uh, it's a 10 step program that helps you trust yourself around food again. And it really explains the reasons behind like eating disorders, binge eating, um, because of diet culture. There, there are over a hundred yeah. studies that prove that diets and starvation diets and yo-yo diets are are really bad for our health so so that mentally and physically yes yeah holistically so i've i've clung to that throughout the years and um i just finished a a uh intuitive eating counselor course where i don't know how i'm going to use it but it just taught me a lot more about intuitive eating and how that that is a really good sense of like support and like proof that not to judge yourself number one and number two like and it's not your fault like all of this that happens to you and then number three like there is a way out and there is a an alternative way to live that can seem counterculture from diet culture and society right now but it it really is like there is a way to live holistically and and trust your body i think i think diet culture is absolutely terrible i've i've struggled with obesity my entire life up until three years ago, you know, I did every diet known to mm-hmm. man. I started Weight Watchers when I was in the sixth grade. I did my first like cocktail of drugs from a, a doctor in Vegas when I was 25. And he literally hands me the pills and looks at me and says, you'll be so hot when you lose weight. And what? You've never yeah. told me that. Yeah. Like it, it, I was taking Topamax, Phentermine, and a fat burning shot every week. And I went from 197 pounds down to 146 in about six months. So extremely, extremely unhealthy. Yeah. I had no appetite. I would just walk around like jittery all the time. Yeah. And as soon as I stopped taking that, I gained all the weight back. But through the next like 15 years, I was constantly battling. I would hire a personal trainer. I would work out. I would do all these things. But the minute I stopped working out, and I'm not talking working out like a 20-minute workout. I'm talking like I was doing three hours at the gym. When I lived in Thailand, I did an hour spin, an hour body pump, and an hour with a personal trainer three days a week. I Mm -hmm. barely drank. I ate incredibly, like, hate the word healthy, but I ate really healthy. And Mm -hmm. The minute I stopped working out, my body was just like, whoop, and I would balloon right back up. So I started really researching about obesity, and it Mm -hmm. was right when Ozempic came out and Mm -hmm. Manjaro, and a friend of mine was on Manjaro, which is, for people that don't know, it's a GLP-1 inhibitor, and it basically slows gastric emptying, and it also works with your brain some magically wonderful way um, to stop the food noise, which I never knew what that was until I started Manjaro. But I went, my doctor gave me Manjaro. I started that and it was like my whole world changed because I wasn't thinking about food all the time. It wasn't guiding me. Mm-hmm. I didn't binge eat. I haven't, I haven't binge eaten in three years wow. or two years because I've been, I've been, I'm, I've been on Manjaro or the compound of it since October, 2022. Mm -hmm. So, and I've lost 60 pounds and this is a drug I'm going to have to be on the rest of my life because obesity is a chronic disease. And I never want to put my body through that again. But during that time, I've become so much more conscious of the way I speak Mm. about weight, about bodies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I even told my mom, because my mom likes to use the word healthy a lot. I'm like, I just, I'm like, mom, that's a a word that really, really triggers me now. If you say something's healthy, it, it makes me feel shame that what I'm eating isn't necessarily healthy. And Mm -hmm. I think I don't, and as a food writer and as someone that posts about food on social media all the time, I'm so 
conscious now about it because I mm-hmm. would do the juice cleanses on my social media and like promote those. I yeah. would talk about calorie free if it's vegan. I would just right. do all these things and say these things. And now looking back, I can't believe I said those things, but you don't know until you know. And I needed right. to go through all of that therapy around eating and obesity and seeing the way doctors are still so incredibly uneducated when it comes to obesity and to kind of learn how toxic Mm -hmm. diet culture is, how Mm -hmm. toxic it is to to talk about calories Mm -hmm. and to talk about, you know, oh, well, I'm going to have this, but then I'm going to go work out for an hour to burn it off. It's just, it's so unhealthy the way we talk to ourselves and the things we say. And for me, that's that's been the biggest struggle for me is kind of learning how to get past that and change my mind because it really is a conscious thing you have to do right to make your brain stop these things right and so i know also with body positivity i for me i'm right around 150 pounds now and i look in the mirror and i still there are times where i'm like oh my gosh like i still look obese i still yeah you know, all the bad words you could say about your body, I still say it. And I know you, you're a big advocate of body positivity. What kind of things can you say to yourself when you're feeling bad? How can you yeah. overcome that? Yeah. Well, first I want to say, I think your story and your situation is in a really cool spot of you, you're taking this GLP, GL, GL1P, GLP1. GLP1. GLP-1 drug, and you're also being really conscious about how diet culture has influenced you in your life. And I think there's not one right answer for anybody, and you're, like, proving that, right? Like, you're you're doing this GLP-1, but you're also working on your mind. And I think if anybody trying to take – doing, you know, taking these drugs, their doctor's prescribing them these drugs, it's really important that they're doing the work that you're doing because – you're you're just being conscious of everything that's affecting you and all the bullshit that you've been told throughout your life and i just really respect you for it and i really respect you for being so outspoken so i just want to say that um and then as for the body positivity i've kind of always iterated on what my stance is on body positivity because the body positivity word, the positive word, I think doesn't really fit what I am trying to um, try or what I'm so passionate about. I think what I, the word that I found that really fits is respect. And this is just going throughout my life. That even more. <laughs> yeah. So and instead of body positivity, I think the body positivity, like influencers and, and, um, and advocators are amazing but for me personally I think body respect is a better word because there are some days where I can't even look at myself in the mirror but then there are some days where I'm like just got out of the shower naked I'm like oh hey girl like you look good yes (laughs) yeah so there are days and and those hard days I I call them like tough uh and I learned this in my intuitive eating class uh, tough food days or tough body days um Mm. I think the way that you talk about them, number one, is really important. So like today is a tough body day. And once you name that, you kind of mm-hmm. give yourself the permission to be like, yeah, this is a tough day. I'm not trying to be anything that I'm not. Like I'm not trying to love my body right now, but I do respect it. And because of that, I'm going to feed it what it needs to be fed. I'm going to take it on a walk. I'm going to, you know, take a nap because I didn't get to sleep last night. Like that I think is a better word because yeah, some days you hate your body. And that's just like a normal, I think that's just a normal human feeling for the society that we live in. And instead of being hard on yourself and being like, oh, I have to love my body all the time. You can just like take a break and, and let yourself be sad and let yourself be like a little disappointed. But because you respect your body, you're still nourishing it in the way that it needs to be nourished. And that in the long term hopefully leads you to a more holistic view of yourself and a more positive outlook on on your body and and your life because what i've learned or what i've experienced with with body positivity i'll have these 
I would have these days where I would um, kind of be a, a, a have like a rebel mind and use my binge eating disorder to like eat until I like felt really, really sick. And, (laughs) and then I'd be like, but wait, that, that wasn't respect like that. I wasn't treating my body with respect. I was just, I was just being like, I was just having a rebel mindset because I'm supposed to be body positive, you know? And then there are days where, um, I feel like I need to like exercise for a long time or eat only salads. And I realize that that's the eating disorder voice and that's yeah. not body positivity. So I think, I think the res- body respect is a good like middle ground and I, it's helped me just live day to day because no matter how I'm feeling, I know that I do deserve respect and everybody and every body deserves respect. Yeah. I think part of what really upsets me is that we have come so far in terms of people being open and accepting, but when it comes to people who are obese, there is still such fat phobia. Oh my God. Out yeah. There. Mm-hmm. And such fat shaming. And the way people treat people who are not the. Real rails you know how we were i was raised in the 90s when heroin chick was yeah. what everyone wanted to be you wanted you know the bones jutting out of your body mm-hmm. and so it's just and, and the backlash that women get for being a normal size oh what's her name that was on sports illustrated cover Hunter mcgrady no the other woman um oh. beautiful i'm i'm blanking on her name Ashley but i can Graham? see her Yes. Yeah. But these women are stunning, but people still feel the need to comment on yeah. these women's bodies. And it's so frustrating. I shared something last night on my personal Instagram about um, men commenting on women mm-hmm. and like calling them crazy or, or, you know, commenting on their body. And it's just, shut up. Yeah. It, it's you have, do not comment on my body. Yeah. And I saw something else where it was a teacher saying, how do you know when you can comment on something? Well, okay. Look at it like this. As a little kid, if you see somebody, can they change what you're going to tell them in 30 seconds or less? Mm-hmm. If the answer is yes, you can say it. If the answer is no, then you don't say it. You can't change your hair in 30 seconds or less. You can't yeah. change the way your body looks in 30 seconds or less. You can pick the dirt off your tooth in 30 yeah. seconds or less, but right. it's, it's trying to teach people at a young age to mind their own damn business and to not yeah. comment like that. Even as I've lost all this weight, I have people that come up to me um, and I know that they mean well, mm. but also I want to be like, shut the fuck up. Mm. There's a, a super that lives by me and uh he walked by me maybe like a year ago and he's like, oh, you're losing weight, huh? I'm like, yeah, he's like, he's like, I like it, I like it. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks, oh, all right. Like, yeah, but what, they're also what? from a different generation. Right. But then the next time he saw me was maybe like a month ago and I was in summer clothes and he walks by me and he says, I really like you like that much better. And I'm just like, what, what does that have to do with me as a person or where – I'm single. And when I get guys commenting, you're so gorgeous. You're so this on my, on my apps, I write them Mm. back and say, I'm really smart too. And they don't respond. Yeah. But it's just, why do people think that they have this right to, to comment? I, it's hard enough being somebody that has issues with their body, but when you add other people weighing in on what they think your body looks like, it's just, it's, it's, it's just a no, it's just Mm -hmm. a hard pass. Just, I, if there's one thing I would like anybody to get out of this is don't comment on people's bodies. Amen. Comment on things that you can control, that they can control. Oh, amen. You know, yeah. like just enough, enough. Yeah. What, what do you, do you have like a line that you say whenever somebody comments on your physical appearance? No, no, because I'm scared. I'm too, yeah. I'm too polite. I'm working on boundaries and there are certain things I will say. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're talking to me about politics, if you're talking to me about Palestine, if you talk to me about my body, I'll be like, thanks. <laughs> See, I'm the what same. You, like, I don't have a you, line. 
what can I, you say? Yeah. It's, it's because like it's triggering for me. Yeah. What I, what I try to think about is like all of the work that I've done to unlearn all of this stuff and all the work you've done, like it's been years of work for us. Right. Yeah. So it's going to take years and years of work. Like probably we won't be alive to see a, a massive change of how people talk to each other about their bodies. I, it, it makes me feel a little bit better because I had, I had to have something terrible happen to me, like an eating disorder to, to realize that this is not okay. Yeah. And these people, they mean well, but it, it isn't, you know, like they're going to have to unlearn and years and yeah. years. And so that's why it's, it's really cool how people are being open about this issue. Yeah. Um, and I think being just as fearless as you can be. For example, like when I had an eating disorder, and my parents didn't really believe that I had one. And it took me lots and lots of, um, it took me to talk to them a lot and for years and to just edu- educate. And I, I did get triggered at some points, like I would get my feelings hurt. But now it's, yeah. I try to just think of it as, as like, I didn't know any of this and I had to educate myself. Yeah. And now, now that I do, like I can educate. And so now like my mom is, is fully on board and she's, she's um, implementing those sorts of things in her life. I'm like so proud of her. And I just think it takes patience on our end, even though it's super triggering. The other day, my boyfriend's dad told me that I lost weight and I was like, like he's, I love him. He's somebody I love, but how do I respond to that? Because it it really triggers me. Exactly. And I'm so conscious of it too, because a really good friend of mine, she's gorgeous, but I, I saw her last week and, and she lost weight and, and I know she did mm-hmm. and she knows she did, but I, there was no way I was like, what can I say to you I that think- isn't going to be like, you look good. You lost weight. Right. Because yeah. you always looked good. And so I told her she, she had a, um, a dress that she wore in this picture. And she's like, I put up a side by side of the dress. And I said, they both look so good on you. And she said, Mm -hmm. yeah, but this one, you know, I like this one better. And I said, yeah, but they like either way, this is like, you're beautiful, you know, but I'm, I'm so conscious of it now. Like Mm -hmm. I don't, I will, I don't think I could ever go up to someone and be like, look at you. Unless it's someone I know that is doing like, that is on Manjara or something in which case I'm like, don't you look skinny? Mm -hmm. Because at that point we're both like joking. Yeah. You understand. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not something I would ever tell anybody because I don't know what their history with with diet culture is mm-hmm. and what's toxic to them. Yeah. And even now, like our society has so much further to go in teaching people how to speak about weight yeah. and how to speak about bodies. Because really, at the end of the day, no one should be talking about anyone else's body. Like, right. it's just... Right no one's business. Right. So it's just an interesting place we're at, I think right now. I agree. Yeah. I think some things that I have told um, people when I'm talking about this is things that make me feel really good is if somebody Mm -hmm. comes up to me and is like, oh my God, you look so strong. You look so happy. You look so happy. Yeah. I think happy is probably the best because glowing, glowing. Yeah. And that is not that is not an equivalent to being in a thinner body. Like if, if, no. if I think that confidence and how the people, how the person is looking in their face, I think that says a lot. And I don't think that has anything to do with, with thin, but if you're trying to give somebody a compliment, like you look really happy, you look like you're doing really well in life. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah. Anything that, that has to do with like that instead of appearance, I've found that to be something that I can say. Cause I catch myself saying some stuff like that too, all the time. I'm like, Oh shit. I still, yeah. I still think like that. And it's just, it's something that we were raised to and it's not our fault. It's not anybody's fault unless they're trying to say something mean to you, then it is. But, um, well, but yeah. people still use fat as a, as an insult. You know, I get people even now they're like, whatever, you look like you're vegan or, you know, mm-hmm. oh, well, how can you be eating your fat or whatever? And it's right. just, why why are adults even why do we try to hurt strangers just because hurt hurt people hurt people people? hurt people (laughs) yeah and yeah (laughs) it sucks 
it sucks, but yeah, it, it really sucks. Especially you, you see the most of it because you're on social media and you have a presence. So it's, that's where it is the worst. And I've been trying to be more outspoken about, about body and the times that I've done it, I've gotten hate comments too. So it's just like, it's part of it. It's just something that like, I have to have a thick skin for, for being a cook. You have to have a thick skin, you know, like if you comment, people are awful online. Yeah. If anybody's trying to do something worth doing, like you have to have a thick skin and yeah. like super respect though because those are the people that that keep me going when I see those people on social media. Well, we have to wrap up, but before we go, I do have one question. Where is the best place you've ever had emergency drinks and why is it at BB and Book Club with me? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> yes, that. That. I was looking at I was looking at my pictures cuz I was trying to find a picture of you with a drink and I saw us eating pizza on the dumpster outside of the <laughs> vegan place that's a vegan pizza place and then after that we went to the bookstore good times like definitely that was one of my favorite emergency drinks with you and I can't wait to do it again and I have to plan a trip to come see you or you have to come to Houston employed I can't well not for long I'm also minimally employed <laughs> if any brand would like to sponsor emergency drinks curious elixir um feel free to DM me. I'm happy to talk about it. And yeah. Emily, I'm going to put in the show notes, all the different ways people can follow you. Uh, and I'll probably want to have you back on at some point. Yes. I feel like there's so I, much we can talk about forever, forever, yeah. ever, but I love you. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for being here. And, um, is there anything you want to say before we close? Just that Diana is amazing and <laughs> everybody should listen to this podcast. She is one of the most fearless and resilient people that I know. So thank you so much for having me on. And if anybody is in the Houston area and would like a private chef, I am starting to do private events. So dinner parties, intimate events. And then I'm also starting a newsletter with new recipes called Eating My Feelings on my website, chefemilyhirsch.com. That is I also a- feel eating my feelings needs to be a brand. So please copyright that immediately. Yeah, and- I'm trying. <laughs> Wait, how do I okay. copyright? I just go to copyright.com. Is that? No. <laughs> you mean- <laughs> I'll send you a lawyer. <laughs> send me a lawyer. There's a whole process. It makes my brain numb. So you don't want me yeah. to know. Yeah. But let's get that taken care of. Okay, we'll get I that taken care of. domain now though. Yes. Okay, domain. Check. See, you're also one All of right. my mentors. So. Oh, I love you. (laughs) I love you too. Thank you for being on the show. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week on Emergency Drinks. Thank you. Bye.